kürsüye davet ediyorum. I'd like to start by uh, thanking uh, the organizers of this event uh, for inviting me to speak uh, to such a distinguished uh, audience. Um, I, in particular, am very pleased uh, to have been invited uh, by Oz, uh, Oz Tuzju, who uh, was very important and influential uh, in the beginnings of our project at Chattelhuyuk. And uh, I think it's fair to say that without his support, we, we could not have got going. So it's a great, uh, a great honor to come back and, uh, and to speak here today. I hope that there will be time uh, for questions at the end, because I'd very much uh, like your expert opinions uh, on the architecture of Chattelhuyuk uh, that I'm going to talk about uh, today. So, as you, as you know, Chattelhuyuk um, is centered uh, in uh, the Konya Plain, uh, southeast of uh, Konya, and it consists of uh, two uh, mounds, uh, the East Mound, which is the main uh, Neolithic mound that I'll be talking about, but there's also a later uh, West Mound. And the East Mound was uh, inhabited from about 7,400 years uh, before the Common Era, 7,400 BCE, to about 6,000. So it was inhabited by maybe 8,000 people at the maximum, uh, for about one and a half thousand years. And there are about 18 levels so that uh, they, they, the, the site was occupied and then reoccupied and reoccupied so that the mound build uh, grew higher and higher. Uh, since we started work at Chattelhuyuk in the mid-1990s, uh, we've constructed this uh, excavation or dig house um, and in the southern part of the site have built this uh, uh, shelter um, where, we are like, where we can work uh, more effectively beneath. And in the north part of the site, uh, there is this uh, shelter again, uh, allowing us to work more effectively and allowing uh, tourism to be more effective. But the story of Chattelhuyuk really begins uh, with uh, James Mellart uh, in the 1960s. And as you know, he found this amazing uh, concentration of houses uh, with people probably moving around on the roofs of houses uh, because there were no streets and no open public areas between the houses. And this is how uh, Mellart reconstructed the architecture uh, of the part of Chattelhuyuk uh, that he excavated. As I said, we now think that maybe 8,000 people lived at Chattelhuyuk at its height, so this is just a small part of the site. But what was particularly um, amazing in the 1960s was the remarkable preservation of the uh, houses or buildings uh, that Mellart uh, found including benches uh, with rows of wild bull horns uh, and these wonderful paintings. So the site became uh, of great international uh, significance because of this enormous uh, concentration of art. Uh, and uh, after the abandonment of the excavations in the 60s, there was a pause until we started work in the 1990s. And what I'm going to do today is not to give a summary of everything that we have now uh, done at Chattelhuyuk and all the new results that we have, but to focus particularly on the architecture. Because as I said before, I very much welcome any thoughts that you might have on our interpretations. So at Chattelhuyuk, uh, a typical building uh, has a main room. This, this is the main room here. 
and then it has a series of side rooms. So this is another way of looking at a typical, uh, this is another uh, Chattelhuyuk house. And this is the main room here. And then you have a series of side rooms. This is one for storage, and there's another one down here, for example, and another here. And uh, in this main room, you have uh, often, or, or nearly always, uh, an oven in the southern part. This is looking into the entrance to the oven, which is here. Uh, the oven, and above the oven, you come down a ladder, and this is the, the mark of the ladder, where the ladder arrived in the room. Uh, and then also in this southern area, you have a hearth. So normally there's an oven and a hearth, and there, are, th there is the ladder entry. Just to look at some details, some examples, uh, this is another building. This is the oven here, which has been destroyed when the, um, this particular building was abandoned. And then above the oven here, you can see the trace of where the ladder was. So this is the scar where the ladder or steps were removed. So this would go up here, and you would enter down the same hole uh, as the smoke escaped. And this, this is a large pit that held the bottom of this uh, ladder. And the plas this is white plaster on the wall, and you can see how it was... Uh, plastered up against the base of the steps, uh, leaving this scar here. Here's some other examples of the ovens. There's quite a, there's a, in fact, a great range of different sorts of uh, ovens uh, at Chattelhuyuk. Some embedded in the wall and some sticking out. And around the ovens and uh, at the base of the ladder, uh, this is the area uh, which we rather unimaginatively call the dirty area of the house because this is where people carried out a whole wide range of productive activities. A lot of this was cooking, uh, done in the oven and hearth, but there was also the making of tools, of bone and of uh, stone, uh, the processing of bone for fat, uh, the making of beads, uh, the sewing of clothes. So a wide range of industrial activities uh, took place in this southern part of the, um, of the house. There were also small entrances uh, from that southern area of the house into the side rooms. And in these side rooms, you again have food preparation, but mainly... Uh, you have different forms of storage. And this was all very small-scale storage. People just stored for enough to keep them going for a few months. Uh, there was no large-scale uh, storage that you see in modern agricultural uh, villages. Uh, they were storing some domesticated crops because they had started domestication, the domestication of plants. But they also stored a lot of wild plants and the bones and meat of both wild and domestic uh, animals. So it was a very much a mixed economy, very small scale, people going out, getting what they needed, storing it for a little bit of time, uh, but not making large amounts of provision uh, for the future. So, so far I've been talking about this southern part of the house, of the main room, and how that's connected to these storage areas, uh, and here again, another one here. So let's go back to this main room, and if we go northwards in the main room, because this is always the south and along here, if we go northwards in the main room, we always rise up. You go up to these higher platforms, and the highest platforms in the north are always uh, very carefully uh, plastered in this very nice white uh, plaster. And it's in this northern part of the room uh, that we get the main concentration of uh, elaborate uh, symbolism. So in this house, for
for example, this is the south side over here. So from the roof where people were moving around, uh, getting access to the house uh, and doing a wide range of other activities, you would come down the steps uh, above the oven and then this would be the dirty or production part of the house with the little doorways going to the storage areas here. But then you move northwards into these higher, whiter platforms, uh, often with uh, very fine matting uh, on them. And it's around these platforms that you have the famous uh, Bucrania uh, and the paintings uh, on the walls. And in particular, uh, it's in these northern platforms that you get people buried. So in, in these northern white platforms, as people died, uh, a new pit was dug and people were placed uh, in the floor and the grave was plastered over. And this could happen many times. So in some, uh, built, some houses, there are 30 or 60. In one case, we have 62 people buried in the northern part of the house. And we think these were also sleeping platforms, uh, and so people would sleep on these white plastered uh, floors just a few centimeters from the decaying flesh uh, of, their, uh, of their relatives or ancestors or the previous occupants of the house. And we have noticed the particular pattern that the the dead burials are surrounded in the most of most of the more, more elaborate uh, art so here's another another house this is the the house here it's a very simple very small house this is the south side here and this is the little western uh, storage rooms. So this is the main room in here. And you go from the dirty floors in the south towards the whiter, higher platforms. And this, this, this burial had uh, about uh, 11 people buried in it. And there were also burials here. But this was the main burial platform. And all around this uh, we found, and in fact on the platform itself, uh, we found painting. So this is uh, this painting was done over and over again. Um, as, as they put a new body in, they would replaster the floor and replaster the platform and the walls around, and then they would repaint uh, around this platform, always in different, fascinatingly different uh, and intricate designs. Um, the, I always think this one looks. Um, the most beautiful, very sort of flowing uh, designs. Uh, but here uh, you can see hands or, or feet uh, along here and various other types of uh, design around that particular platform. I want to look at a, another building uh, now. Th this is in um, the uh, northern part of the site under the northern shelter. And this is the building uh, here. Looking again from the south, th this is the south side here, looking into this uh, house. Um, again, it's clearly a domestic building. We have all the evidence of the production and preparation of food in the southern part and the side storage rooms connected to that. And then as you move northwards, in this main room here, uh, you particularly, your eye is drawn to this uh, platform in the northeast corner, which has big uh, wild bull horns uh, set into these clay pedestals. And in fact, the, the skulls, the front part of the skulls of these wild bulls, uh, were, we found them inside these pedestals. I'll come back to that platform, but as we were uh, excavating it, we noticed that um, there were some dips in the surface. And as we followed those uh, dips down, those hollows down, um, and as we gradually removed all the different layers 
of plaster uh, getting down through this uh, platform. We found lots and lots of evidence of red paint. Uh, they seem to have um, repainted this platform in red every time that they buried someone in it. And then under, in the burial pit, this is, this is the platform here. This whole thing is the platform, the northeast platform. Uh, we've removed the, bu the bull's horns here. And you can see this big pit. And uh, at the last count, we haven't actually finished. We, we have not finished excavating this pit. But at the last count, there were 13 bodies or bits of 13 bodies that had been placed uh, in, this, um, in this platform. And around the platform, we found a great diversity of uh, wonderful uh, uh, designs. Uh, this is uh, an incised uh, rectilinear uh, decoration. Uh, immediately above the platform, uh, there was uh, a niche here, you can see it again here, that's painted in red with the niche marked out against the wh a white background. And above the niche, uh, this is, um, we thought at first it was a goat's head, but when we took it apart, we found that, in fact, it was the, the head of a very young wild uh, bull, so a calf's, uh, wild calf's head. Uh, you can just see the, um, uh, the horn sticking out. And this was repainted and replastered many times, sometimes in red, sometimes in white. And then ab also above the platform, we found these um, uh, handprints, which are real handprints. Someone has put their hand in red and has slapped, uh, slapped the wall so you can see the, fing the fingerprints very, very clearly. And in fact, the, in the end, we found 13 of these right hand prints all the way along the wall uh, above that platform. And then to the right of the platform, we also found this, uh, this geometric design. So my point here is that uh, there's an enormous concentration of art in this one building, but it's all concentrated in the northern part of the main room uh, and is concentrated around the platform where a, a good number of people have been uh, buried. So if we look again at this type of uh, image um, of one of the uh, buildings at uh, Chatelhuyuk, what one can say is that these small houses, and they are quite small, uh, five to seven meters across, these small uh, houses concentrate all the different functions that in a modern city are separated into different parts of the city. So in the uh, southern part, uh, we have uh, the um, production area or the industrial zone, if you like, um, the whole uh, area is a residential uh, zone, is also used for uh, storage. And the northern part has the cemetery, uh, the bedroom, uh, and it also has uh, the, the sort of ritual uh, and art uh, functions. So all these different functions in a modern city are separated, but one of the distinctive aspects of these small-scale societies is that everything is integrated into, at least at Chatelhuyuk, is integrated into one building. And so the building, the architecture of Chatelhuyuk, is something which has to provide a wide range of different sorts of functions. And the architecture itself emerges out uh, of those sorts of functions. But the people of Chatelhuyuk had a terrible time uh, with their buildings. They were very, very important. The whole of Chatelhuyuk is based around the house. There is nothing at Chatelhuyuk except houses and areas of rubbish or midden. So the house is very important. And yet they had a terrible time uh, with their houses. And as we dug more and more at Chatelhuyuk, 
we've realized this more and more. So this is now a common sight at Chatelhuyuk. This is a, a wall uh, made of mud brick, like all the walls at Chatelhuyuk, but you see how it has bent over and bowed outwards instead of being straight here, which is what it should be. It's bowed outwards and has just fallen over. And these are all the bricks. These are all the bricks and the mortar that have fallen off this. And as we dug more and more down here, we found the whole wall had just uh, fallen over, collapsed over. And we find many uh, examples of this. Uh, these are some other examples. Here is a wall that should be upright, but is just leaning all the way over. And, th and these leans and these uh, collapses happened during the Neolithic period. They're not something that happened afterwards. Uh, here's another wall here that's leaning right over. Uh, this wall here is uh, leaning, it should be upright, but it's leaning this way. And so they've had to build another wall here to try and hold it upwards. And as we excavate, we have to all the time hold up the walls with various struts uh, because they very easily uh, collapse. They're very, very unstable. Um, I think Mellart talked about all the walls at Chatelhuyuk uh, leaning at dizzying angles. And so when you go to Chatelhuyuk today, you can see a lot of Chatelhuyuk as we have excavated it, and you think, oh, this is wonderful. Um, we are looking at Neolithic walls and, and how well they have survived for 9,000 years. But in fact, that is just um, an artifice uh, because the walls only stand because we pump them full of uh, chemicals and grouts and cements and mortars to, to make sure they stand up. And we have to do this every month, every year, trying to keep the walls upright. So this is partly just a problem to do with uh, the unfired mud brick. But at Chatelhuyuk, uh, the, uh, the mud is a smectitic clay, so it's got a lot of smectite in it. And this means that it expands and contracts very, very rapidly when you put water in it and you take water out. So as, as the walls uh, get wet, they expand, and then they contract, and so they're very, very unstable. And this was a very uh, major problem uh, for the inhabitants of Chatelhuyu. So although the architecture was an expression of the social world of Chatelhuyu, it also caused an enormous problem and an endless, um, uh, it, there was an endless need for labor in order to keep the, um, the walls uh, upright. So I want to talk to you about some of the, the problems uh, and some of the ways that they were dealt with uh, as people dealt with the architecture of uh, Chatelhuyu. One very simple thing that they did through time to make the houses more stable uh, was to invent the brick uh, r right at the beginning of uh, Chatelhuyuk, uh, the, uh, the bricks uh, can be 1 to 1.5 meters long, and they're very, very thin, and we think they were probably made on the wall, and the mortar, this is a white marl mortar, is just as thick as the brick is. And these bricks, uh, these long, thin bricks, uh, are made of uh, a mud, with organic material uh, put into it. These were very, very unstable, and through time, people build, made bigger and bigger bricks. You can see the much bigger bricks here, m built these bigger bricks, which were not so long, they were just 30, 40 centimeters long, uh, and they had much uh, sandier texture, so they started putting a lot of sand uh, into the bricks to to try and make these walls more uh, solid. They also made the bricks wider and the walls wider so that um, uh, by the top of Chatelhuyuk, the sum of the walls are a meter wide in order to try and uh, make them stable. So one thing they did was through time, 
during the one and a half thousand years of occupation, they gradually made something that looked more like a sandy brick in our sorts of terms. Another thing uh, that they did in their desperation uh, at Chatelhuyuk to try and hold the house up uh, was to add a frame of wood uh, that helped to hold the, hold the mud brick walls uh, upright. And so uh, what you can see here uh, is this is the scar on the wall where there used to be a wooden post. Uh, these wooden posts um, are, are made of oak or juniper, uh, brought down from the highlands, uh, and they were placed in here to help hold up the wall, and then the white plaster was plastered around, uh, around the post, and this building was destroyed in a fire, and so this post has been burnt out, but you can see the trace where, where it used to be. So the post helped uh, to hold up um, the, the house, to hold up the walls anyway. But sometimes the, um, the posts didn't work either, and so they, they would recruit the ancestors uh, to help hold up the posts. So here uh, there is a pit that used to hold the post that w came up the wall here. We're looking down into the pit. This is where they put the post uh, that helped to hold up the wall here. But at the bottom of the post, they put uh, the skull of, a, of a, a human skull. We know that they thought human skulls were very important. Uh, in, some, in some cases, uh, people had their heads removed after burial. So people were buried in the pit under the platform. They were left there for about a year, and then the skulls were removed. And we know from lots of types of evidence that this removal of, skull, of skulls uh, indicated uh, that, that the person was a very important person. And so it seems reasonable to suggest that this is the skull of an ancestor uh, that has been placed at the bottom of the post to help hold the post up and to hold the house up. And in fact, at Chatelhuyuk, there are many what we call foundation burials where ancestors are placed at the base of the new house in order to help found it. But the wooden structure was actually more complicated than just uh, the posts. Uh, this is a building that we've excavated uh, recently. We're looking, this is the south wall, the oven is here and the hearth, this is the southern area and the side storage room in here. And then we move northwards into the whiter platforms. And you see very nicely how this beautiful white plaster has been placed on the walls in the northern part of the house. And what I'm going to do is to, to talk to you about this uh, slot here. Uh, because this is a very high wall, it's about uh, three meters high that has survived, so we get a good look at the way these walls were constructed. But first of all, I'm going to show you uh, something that we found this year, uh, here above this burial platform. So there's a burial platform again, and again, right above it, we find uh, painting. Uh, th this is a wonderfully fresh and clear painting. Um, at Chatelhuyuk, as I've said, you have many, you can have 450 layers of plaster on the wall. They, they put new white plaster on every month or every season, so you can have 450 layers. And we have to gradually take them, these layers off, layer by layer, using these scalpels. And in this case, as we did this, we came across this painting. And um, I'd be interested to have your thoughts on it uh, because at one level, uh, you can say it's just a geometric design. And perhaps all, that is all one should say. But because at, at Chatelhuya, we are always excavating house walls, it became very difficult not to see 
this as bricks, as a brick pattern, uh, and here as well. And so we talk about this, pat this design as the brick uh, design. Uh, you can see that the more of the pattern here, it's in this lower register, it doesn't continue above, it's in just in this lower part of the wall above the burial platform. You have these vertical lines and then you have these sort of sinuous lines uh, are these brick pathways? Are these, are these, is this pathways across roofs? Uh, you know, is this, is this actually looking inside upwards at a roof from the inside of a building? You begin to be able to see all sorts of things uh, in this, uh, but perhaps uh, we're going too far, and perhaps one should simply say uh, that it's a geometric design. Uh, this was a small niche a small niche in the wall uh, where we found uh, um, a collection of uh, obsidian, obsidian blades. Anyway, th this is uh, the painting, difficult to interpret, uh, but um, very fascinating. We, and then it's another thing, I don't know if any of you have got any suggestions, we don't know why they always divide up the wall in these horizontal panels. And why do they do this? Th this one uh, then uh, it was filled with red when we worked more on it. It's full of red here. And so you go up here, you come inwards, you go up, then there's this... this um, so we, don't, we, we have no idea wh what, why this is. I have no idea myself about why. It's very, very common at Chatelhuyuk to have these um, horizontal panels. But, and you see them again here, these ones. This is where the painting came up later. So these are the panels, and this is the trace of the post. And here's another trace of the post. But we do know what this is, because inside here we find the traces of wood. So there was a wooden beam that went along here and continued all the way along here. And the wooden post goes up to the uh, beam, but the wooden post does not continue here. And this whole area here uh, it, um, protrudes or extends into the room. So you go up here, there's the post, and then this is, this is a protrudes into the room. It's, in, it's set into the room. So we can see this more clearly on one of uh, Mellart's drawings. We've just been looking at something like this with the wall s s set inwards. And why they do this is not clear. What, why do they do this? Is it something to do with uh, uh, bearing the weight we now know that this is not an accurate representation of the roof. The roof was very, very thick with large amounts of clay on it, so it must have been a great weight. So perhaps uh, this is something to do with bearing the weight or spreading the weight from the roof. But what's interesting is that these posts uh, come up here, and here again is the inset, the setting in with, on the wooden beam here going round there, the wooden beam going round there. But the posts don't go right up to the roof. The posts just come up to this wooden beam. So my suggestion is uh, that this wooden uh, beam is a, a way of tying the whole uh, house together and trying to create stability in, in a context in which these walls are always prone to, to, to bend and move around. So this is a way of creating stability. Uh, why this is inset, I don't know, and why these only stop here, uh, we don't really know. So, Another detail is that at the top of these wooden posts, which are plastered over, we find these capitals, uh, which are made of plaster. And this is, this is one 
that you can see. This is, the, this is the trace of the wooden post in here. This is the overhang, the, the inset uh, at the upper part of the wall. And here is this big pillow. And what we find is that there are wooden beams that go from inside, that go through this uh, pillow. But it, it doesn't seem to have any clear function, although we did find a human skull just here that may have once stood uh, or been placed on this, um, placed on this uh, pillow uh, capital. So what I've been trying to show you is that one of the ways that they tried to hold up the house was to have this wooden structure of the upright posts and the horizontal, this horizontal beam that held the whole thing together and stopped movement. And then on the top here, uh, or a bit higher than this, uh, they placed the beams uh, for the roof. But one of the uh, new discoveries that we have made uh, is that there is clear evidence that some buildings, and, and not all buildings, but some buildings had a second story. So, sorry. So in, in, this, in this room, this is the overhang here, and these are the upright posts with their pillows, and this is all the rubble, all the stuff that was burnt and thrown into this building. And here you have a big wall with plaster on, attached, it was originally attached to a plaster floor. So this must have come down from the second story. So there must have been another floor up here somewhere that collapsed uh, into this building when the building collapsed. And so this is an attempt to reconstruct that, that you have these downstairs rooms and then you go up to an upstairs room and all our evidence so far is that these upstairs rooms were just as elaborate and fancy as these ones down here but then you go up uh, to the, the roof at the top so some, some houses have two stories but some have just one so you just go up and this is the roof uh, immediately so We've seen you know, some of the things that they do to try and hold up these very unstable buildings at Chattelhuyu. They, they make bigger, more sandy bricks. They make these elaborate uh, wooden frames that help to hold the house together. One of the other things that they do, which I think is very significant, is that they lean against each other. Perhaps there are other reasons for this, but it's interesting at Chattelhuyu how every house has its own wall, and yet the walls are snugly placed uh, against other buildings. So for example, here you can see a, a building. It has its own walls there, but it's immediately against the wall of another building here, which goes there. And this is the wall of another building here. And this is the wall of another building here. As we'll see, there may be many reasons for wanting to live close together, but one uh, reason, in my view, is that this is a very effective way of trying to protect uh, these unstable walls because there is no gap here, so the rainwater cannot get down and, and expand and contract uh, these walls. And also, they lean up against each other. And so there's a, a stability that is created out of the whole which the individual part does not have. And so in effect, you can produce the whole distinctive social system at Chattelhuyuk simply by the need to have one house built closely against the other. The famous... Uh, honeycomb pattern at Chattelhuyuk. These are all double walls. There's no need to do this. Uh, they could just use the same wall. But they all have their own wall and they put them closely against other walls. And the whole communal, collective, uh, agglomerative uh, nature of Chattelhuyuk can simply be produced 
just by the architectural need to be close to other buildings. And so this is an example of an architecture which is very thoroughly embedded within a particular uh, social system, but is not just produced by that system, it actually creates it as well. So one can argue that the, the nature of the house, the nature of the architecture at Chattelhuyuk produces a tightly knit agglomerative community. Of course, there were other reasons uh, that people uh, lived very close together. And many people have given you know, different sorts of reasons for it. But in my view, the only really good uh, other explanation is to do with the burial of the dead and the very important role that the ancestors played at Chattelhuyu. Not all buildings at Chattelhuyu have burials. There are many buildings that have no burials. The burials are concentrated in certain buildings and the size of the circles here tells you how many people are buried. I think there are about 35 buried in this uh, building. We, we're certain that there were not enough people inside these buildings to produce that amount of dead people. So we argue that the people who were buried in one of these uh, burial buildings uh, lived in other buildings. So we think that people lived in other buildings and they buried their dead in the central building or uh, they took skulls from this building and used them in their own houses. So there was a relationship between the houses and these, um, uh, and these uh, central burial houses. So one explanation for Chattelhuyuk is that people wanted to live very closely together because they wanted to live close to their ancestors because in these types of society all social status depends on your relationship to your ancestor which fields you can use which animals you can keep uh, who you can go to for help all of these things depend on your relationships to the ancestors and so people want to live very close uh, to these ancestral uh, houses. And that's another reason, as well as the problems with the architecture, that causes this uh, tightly knit agglomerative uh, pattern. But it's, th there are other ways in which community is created at Chattelhuyuk. I started off this talk talking very much about the individual house. What I'm now talking about is the way in which the architecture and the society combine to create a particular form of urban life. What we can see uh, here are groups of houses, but between them we find areas of rubbish. I haven't talked very much about rubbish, uh, but I said before that there is nothing at Chattelhuyuk except houses and rubbish. As people did their work inside these houses, and they had their fires and their ovens, they would take the ashes and the human excretions out up the ladder, across the tops of the roofs, and throw them over the edge into these sunken areas, these what we call midden or rubbish or refuse areas, chirp areas. And all this community did that here, this community did it around here, this community did it here. So this is a group of houses that is connected in probably many ways, uh, but one of the ways it's connected is that they all put their rubbish in the same area and this then becomes a zone of rubbish that separates one community from another one. But we can see it's actually more complicated. The more you look at these plans, the more you see in them. Can you see here how these pairs of buildings 
are attached to each other all the way down a line here. It seems they all seem to be on a line. And a little bit the same here. And perhaps also here you can see another line that's radiating out all these lines and then this way as well and these lines here. We begin to be able to perhaps argue that there are these radial lines where all the houses, the buildings are organized along these lines or else they become areas of refuse. So within these big social sectors there seem to be these radial lines that all come towards the top. This is the top of this particular part of Chattelhuyuk, the highest part. And in the south area of the site, we see the same thing. That this is the high part of Chattelhuyuk. And you can see if you follow these lines, how they just go all the way through like this. And again here, they, they don't need to do this. But all the walls seem to be lined up in relation to each other. So we have these sort of radial lines. And one interpretation of this uh, is that these are communities of people who are linked together by the fact that they come from some ancestral house uh, in the center of the, in center of the site. And this is quite common in these types of small-scale societies, that as the, as the community grows, the plan is created out of the relationships between people. So I tried to um, show this in this uh, model or diagram. If you imagine that uh, at the bottom of Chattelhuyu there are a small number of houses, individual houses, all leaning against each other. And that as these houses have offspring, uh, people want to stay close to their ancestral house. So you begin to get these sectors that emerge that as these houses themselves divide with their offspring, you get further divisions. So as you go through time, one, two, three generations, you go down these long radial lines with the more ancient houses at the top and the more recent ones down here. This is uh, still a hypothesis at the moment, um, but there, are, there is some evidence that we do indeed find this. Uh, we do indeed fi seem to find the earlier houses at the center and the later ones at the ends of these radial lines. But it suggests that Chattelhuyuk is actually a very complicated uh, social uh, arrangement, which is all based around uh, the notion of ancestral links to founding houses and founding groups. What I've been showing you is two sets of radial lines that center around this northern part of uh, the main Chattelhuyuk site and another set of radial lines that are uh, around this high point. So in a lot of our data, we seem to see two parts of Chattelhuyuk and there is a big gully or gap uh, between them, a dip, a dip between the northern and the southern parts of the, the main East Mound. So as well as all these smaller scale communities at Chattelhuyuk, it seems possible that you have two large scale communities that had a lot of interchange and interaction with each other, but they still did some things uh, differently. For example, our evidence suggests that the two communities grazed their sheep uh, in different parts of the landscape. So if we look at, uh, at Chattelhuyuk, um, what we used to see was just a lot of individual houses. But what we now understand is that the society is divided into a set of uh, groups, uh, social groups, maybe they were clans, um, uh, or lineages, whatever we would call them today, but a series of groups, uh, some of them small neighborhoods where people buried the dead together, uh, some of them uh, larger scale groupings of houses in radial lines or in two halves of the settlement. So the whole set of groups. And the w 
there was, no, there was nothing else. There was no central power, no central organization. Uh, there is no ritual center at Chattelhuyuk. Uh, there is no administrative center. There is no chiefly residence. In fact, our evidence suggests that it was wrong at Chattelhuyuk to show difference. It was wrong to show status. It was wrong to show wealth. So if people did amass things, they hid them, either by uh, digging them under the ground or keeping them in small rooms where it was difficult to get access. So Chattelhuyuk was a very egalitarian uh, society. And you can see this also in the architecture, because all the houses are very uh, similar. Some are bigger and some are smaller. But whether they are big or small has no relationship with anything else. The big houses, the ones with more symbolism in, do not have more goods, they do not have more storage, they do not have more production, they do not have more wealth. So everything at Chattelhuyuk was the same. And it seemed very important not to show difference. In the bricks, what we find is that people share the same sources of bricks. It is not the case that one house has private property of some land and that it gets its material for bricks from that land. From our chemical and other analysis of the bricks, we can say that all um, people at Chattelhuyuk shared the same sources. And that was true of very many aspects of life at Chattelhuyuk. And so the architecture at Chattelhuyuk, the very tight knitting of lots of houses together, is a product of a particular architectural need, but it's also a product of a particular social system. And so this tightly bound together society was bound together architecturally, and there was a very strong sense of equivalence between all the different parts. So we can certainly talk uh, about Chattelhuyuk as the origin of cities. But in my view, that's not a very helpful uh, way of thinking about it. Chattelhuyuk is certainly large and very dense. But it was not a city in most of our modern senses. And so I think it's important to understand Chattelhuyuk in its own terms as a product of a particular social and architectural world. And for me, one of the most fascinating things about it is how well the architecture, the way houses were built and the way the whole um, urban setting was built, the very close relationship between that and, and the social system. And so when we argue that uh, Chattelhuyuk is the origin of cities, or when it's shown as the model uh, for uh, the urban nature of uh, Turkey and of Istanbul and all these sorts of leaps that we make, I think we have to be very careful. Um, this image here, perhaps it is indeed of a, of a city, although I, I doubt it myself, but perhaps this is some image um, of a city like Chattelhuyuk or a town like Chattelhuyuk with its little houses all tightly packed together and its main rooms and the side rooms. Maybe this is an, an urban uh, image, um, but, and, and, and this is a very nice you know, modern rendering, it, rendering of it uh, at Shanghai. But I think it would be wrong to say that there is some link, uh, direct link, uh, between this type of uh, urban uh, way of life and our own. Uh, I think uh, that there are, we have to understand that Chattelhuyuk uh, was a product of a very particular uh, social and architectural world. Thank you.
Yes. 